Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the House of the Deaf podcast. In each episode of this show, we are going to pick and break down one major topic, which is critical for those who see their lives and careers as video game developers. And it's important to say that this ain't going to be just another video gaming talk show. We are going to try and be really useful for a very specific group of people, those who are eager to make games and want to know more about the insides of the industry, and those who already make games, maybe have one or two released projects uh, or a vertical slice or a demo version and want to make their future games better. So this is how we describe our listeners, not just gamers and not top tier experienced game developers as well. We are somewhere in the middle for those who are in the middle of their roads. This podcast supports the third annual Unreal Engine Dev Contest. So yeah, the show is also for those who participate. See the link in description. And if you have any kind of game made with Unreal technology, any genre, in any condition, be it a prototype, a vertical slice, or some sort of teaser, and it's not released yet, don't be shy and join the competition. As always, there are some serious prizes at the stake, so just make it happen. This is Rafael Colantonio with the House of the Dev. And my name is Peter Salnikov, and we kindly welcome you to the House of the Dev. You are entering the House of the Dev. Today we're going to talk about the team, assembling and managing it, finding the right people, legal aspects and uh, other related stuff. And uh, our guest expert on this is one of the key people behind Ultima Underworld, System Shock, Thief, Deus Ex and many other games, Mr. Warren Spector. Hello and thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. This is, uh, this is great. Looking forward to it. This is amazing. I actually can't believe I just said that things. So yeah, uh, let's say uh, we, you have an idea that seems complete and you want to make a game that will earn some money. You have no experience in the business, but you surely know how to do at least one thing. Uh, let's say drawing or writing or managing human resources or something else. And uh, you don't want to be alone in this. You probably see yourself as a product owner and you've played a lot of video games. That sounds like a pretty common situation these days. Where do you start? Well, the, the first thing, uh, you have to surround yourself with, uh, with the right people. And, and by right, what I mean is uh, a variety of things. One is people who fill in your gaps, who can uh, be good at the things that you're not good at. Uh, I, for example, am not a programmer. I am not an artist. I, I'm not exactly sure what I am or how I keep getting jobs, but um, I need to find people who can um, who can do the the day to day of design. I haven't built a a game level since 1999, I think 98, uh, and you don't want to see what I built. Trust me. Um, so you need to you need to start looking around for people who uh, are good at the things you're not. Um, the other thing I think is really important is you need to have a clear enough vision that you can go find uh, what I said a minute ago, the right people. Um, you, you need to find people who uh, either you can sell on your vision, I guess, or who already believe in, in the kinds of games you want to make. Um, I have a very specific um, philosophy, I guess, uh, and I, I think of that as as you know, I, I have a mission. Uh, there are certain kinds of games I want to make, and I have no interest in making anything but that kind of game. And if you bring on people who don't like that kind of game, you're in a world of trouble. Uh, and I, I've been there. I, I learned that the hard way. I thought I could convince people to be interested in what I was interested in, and uh, that did not work. Um, another example, uh, when uh, I started Junction Point, um, which I did in 1996, I guess, um, I had uh, a cabal of people who wanted to leave the company we were all at to do something new and, and different and, and independent. And so we were scheming a lot. And what we schemed about was we wanted to um, work with folks in Hollywood to create um, IP together, not license their IP or have RIP licensed, but to work together 
And uh, to do that in the context of um, mature, um, adult-oriented, uh, epic, uh, you know, immersive simulations. That's what we decided we wanted to do. And we worked on that for quite a while uh, until Disney came along. And uh, to make a long story as short as I'm capable of making anything, we can go into more detail about this if you want. But uh, I ended up agreeing to make a Mickey Mouse game. And let me tell you, when you come back to a team of people who want to make epic, mature, uh, immersive simulations, and you say, guess what, folks? We're making a Mickey Mouse game. Um, the reaction is interesting. Um, and in fact, I, I lost my best level builder because he said, I, I don't want to make a Mickey Mouse game. And I lost my lead writer who said, I don't have that voice. I can't, I can't do that. Uh, so he left too. And it, it was frankly the best thing that could have happened to the project, the studio, and to their careers. Uh, you need to find people who buy into what you want to do. There's, there's almost nothing more important than that. Yeah, I, um, I can relate to the, the to a lot of that, and uh, including the the part where you say, uh, you know, you're a, you're on a mission. There are you you know what you want to do, and by communicating it to the people very loud and clear, then you will attract the right people. That said, it's easier once you've done something, right? Once be, because then you can, people recognize you for that and then they want to join you. Um, I think one of, it's harder when you start, right? So like what what would, what would should someone who start do? Uh, if they start, they don't, maybe should they should have at least money or, or can they recruit, uh, you know, another bunch of people at the same level or can they even recruit people that are um, that already have a resume in the game industry um, just by their passion, you know, just by convincing them through passion. Do you think this is possible? Uh, well, passion certainly matters. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I think it would be really challenging. I've never actually done that, to be honest. Uh, but I would imagine it, it would be challenging to get people who are more advanced in their careers. If you're just starting out and you have a great idea, uh, I think you probably want to look to your your network of, of friends. Um, you know, if you're in, in school, as lots of independent developers are, um, find the folks that you worked with well when you were in school uh, and, and don't worry about money. I mean, uh, when I started, I was not making a lot of money, let me tell you. Uh, I did it because I, I was passionate about it and I, I felt like like it was a calling. I mean, it wasn't a job. It wasn't something I did to pay the rent. It was because I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And um, I think you have to you have to look around for folks like that. Um, the other mm -hmm. thing I would do is, uh, again, I'm kind of making this up, but I, I would uh, not quit my day job. Um, I know lots of people, mostly writers, uh, who worked in let's just say non-taxing environments. So they, they reserve their creative energy for uh, after hours or weekends uh, and their passion pulled them through. I mean, they, they paid their rent one way and then they, they pursued their, their desired career uh, in, a, in another way. So uh, I think it's, it's build on your network, find people who are about at your level uh, I, I wouldn't go, like if someone came to me with a great idea, I probably wouldn't go join you. You know, I mean, it's just realistically, that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, find people at your own level. Uh, oh. And then, you know, maybe it's even going to uh, an IGDA meeting or 10 or 100 and not to network, not to, not to schmooze, you know, guys like you and me. Uh, but to, to meet your peers and start talking about what's important to you and what your mission is. I mean, it's funny because I'm, I'm actually giving a lecture, a virtual lecture next Tuesday, uh, basically about this topic. I mean, you, you need to figure out what your mission is and what your success criteria are, and then find other people who share that. Um, and and you know, the IGDA is a pretty good, pretty good way of doing that. Um, universities, uh, 
you know, join the uh, the video game club. Uh, some of them will even let you come if you're not a student. So find those people uh, and, yeah. and grab them. Yeah, I agree very much. And then you have a chance later on, once once finally the people at the same level as you are, and together with them you, you do something, uh, you have a chance to, of course, recruit uh, bigger people, right? That's that's the beauty of that approach. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, I've asked uh, a couple of questions here and there, and uh, there's a certain point of view that a beginner studio on its way to the first demo version needs to do as much stuff for free as possible. I mean, I know people uh, personally who have been making their games for a couple of years now, um, and uh, their teams consist of 20, 30 experienced people who at this point work for free, hoping that later they will find a publisher or get a grant or something. Uh, someone will invest in them. And now they're concentrating on their work to uh, really impress their potential partners. But how does that even work? I don't get it. I mean, somehow you have to motivate those people to even join you and how in the world would you manage a team that works for free that sounds like an anarchy and a possible disaster but it still works in many cases a, a lot of team management is is anarchy that's for sure um, but i can't even imagine building a team of 20 or 30 volunteers it's hard enough to build a team of 20 or 30 people who are actually getting paid well that uh, certainly doesn't happen in a second it takes time Honestly, I wouldn't even start there. I, I can't imagine why you would set your sights that high. Uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, at, at other side, the, the uh, studio where I, I'm working now, um, Paul Nurath and I made a commitment to each other that we were going to build teams of 20 to 25 people and focused on triple uh, I AAA or double A, whatever you want to call it, and not even try to compete in uh, the triple a space i mean frankly i've been there and my last project i had 800 people on it look at the credits it's horrifying um so we're for you know pretty experienced folks and we're actually paying people and it's still hard to to find the right people and, and keep them motivated and all heading in the same direction so um I, you know i sometimes let my mouth get ahead of my brain and and, and offend people but I think it sounds crazy to try to do a 20 or 30 person volunteer team. You know, start out with four or five, put together a, a, a prototype, uh, you know, go to GDC and show it off at the, uh, you know, the Indie Showcase area where, where people like me go around and look at stuff and find cool stuff and try to recruit folks who are, who are doing cool stuff or encourage people who are making games that, you know, that I want to play. Um, You know, there was there was one uh, one year I went to GDC and um, I was looking at a, at a project and you know I, I wasn't trying to make a big deal or or comment or critique or anything but I guess they noticed my badge and said oh man we were totally inspired by your, your one block role playing game idea and that's what we're building and you know those are folks that if they want a job I'm going to listen to them you know and if they they want someone to help support their efforts. I'm going to, I'm going to assume they do a good job. I'm going to go in there and, and, you know, uh, advocate for them, but that's, that's a team of, you know, four people. Um, and look at how many people made Minecraft for crying out loud. You know, it's, you don't need a big team to do something really cool. Yeah, sure. But I mean, uh, what I described, well, it's a real case uh, in our competition. We got a game uh, called Age of Silence. It's a huge role-playing game, might and magic style, first person, 3D open world. And yeah, and they are making it for like, they've been making it for uh, two or three years now. And uh, a company this huge, of course, it doesn't form in a day. Like, we gather 20 people in a room, let's make a game, yeah, let's do this. Of course not. So, yeah, they are actually wondering, they were, before the pandemic started, they were um, traveling through different kind of conferences and uh, encouraging people to join them. And this is, uh, this sounds kind of crazy to me because, uh, well, I imagine how much time uh, it takes to make a game. I can almost see gathering that many people on a volunteer basis if they're all doing what I said a minute ago, you know, 
actually paying their bills doing something else, which I assume mm -hmm. they are. Um, the, and I assume, you know, keeping people motivated and heading in the same direction wouldn't change much if you're paying them or not. I mean, you know, anybody who's in the game business for money is, is insane. Uh, you know, you can, A, you can make more money doing something else in a lot of cases, in most cases. But also, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 38 years now. And honestly, I don't know how I've survived, you know, other than it's a calling, you know, I, I, I have to do this. But I always tell people, if you want security, go, go find something else. If you want to make a lot of money, go find something else. Um, and it, it's like, if I can scare you off, you wouldn't have had a chance of making it anyway. Um, so I, I think the what you have to do is is make sure that those 20 people all know what you're trying to do. I mean, that's the secret to managing any project, right? I mean, there I'm a big believer in there being if not one person, then you know a, a small cadre of people who who create what I call the creative box, which is the constraints that everybody else has to work within. And it's not telling people what to do. It's saying, here's the game we're making, folks. If something doesn't fit with that game, I don't care how good the idea is, it's not going to happen. And somebody has to be able to say that to keep everybody going in the same direction, you know? And having a clear set of goals and a clear mission, a small M mission, you know, on a specific game uh, is, is necessary no matter what you're doing. But if... As soon as you've got 20, 25 people, 30 people, you you have to, you know, have someone who can say no. And someone who, who if they have to say no, they haven't done their job, you know. So I I would I would say whether they're volunteering or not, um, it can't just be democracy, you know. Democratic game development is uh, has never worked in my experience, let's put it that way. Man, that's, I'll have to be thinking about that a lot. 25 or 30 volunteers. Oof, man. Kudos to them, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Man, if they can pull it off. I mean, that's um, the idea of, of a game that, that's that scope uh, made by volunteers is, is pretty amazing. If they pull it off, that'll be remarkable. Um, the, the, the other thing I, that comes to mind uh, when you when you say that when you describe that is I'm not exactly sure why they've been working for two to three years it seems like it would have been more sensible to put together a prototype and a trailer and go out and find the funding you know well it actually just seems like that would have been easier uh, the actually they have a trailer and a prototype uh, and they will come up with the new demo version this year like next month uh, but they uh, they're not in the rush to sell themselves to anyone uh, let's put it this way um, as again, I see it uh, you know either either you sell fund I mean when I started Junction Point I I self-funded it for a while um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a sure way to lose all your money, you know, getting in the game <laughs> business again to, to make money. It's just not, not sensible, but, you know, there's a truism in, in the business that 80% of games fail, uh, and, and of the games that succeed 80% of 20% uh, of those make all the money, you know? So, um, finding a partner. Uh, unless you're really small, this seems sensible to me. I would, I would, I would have been, I would have prototyped something in six months, nine months, and then seen if I could find someone to, to, to take some of the load off. You know? Yeah. So let's say you are moving towards a prototype, but you are, I don't know, you're an artist or you are a writer or a potential producer, and you don't know how to, you know, program things you don't know the engines you don't know uh, nothing about the the video game development itself so who do you need on board in the first place and uh, who can you find a bit later 
if you got nine months to develop a vertical slice? Well, there I wouldn't say vertical slice, by the way. A vertical slice is something bigger than a prototype. Yeah, of course. But of course. but I you know, I would I would say uh, a couple of things. Um, one is there there are game engines out there now, and everybody knows who they are, <laughs> that are a lot easier to learn and a lot more powerful than anything, you know, we had 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so you can actually pick some stuff up and, and learn it fairly quickly and easily. Um, but the second thing is, um, I, I would I would be looking to build a, a, a set of advisors. You know, even a more experienced group needs, needs a set of advisors, people who are not directly involved with the project, who can, who can help, help keep you on track and uh, provide, well, advice. I mean, that's what advisors do. Um, you know, I've, I've done that for, for a bunch of studios uh, that I had nothing to do with, uh, other than I thought, you know, the idea was great. I thought the people were cool. Uh, you know, uh, they, could, they could ask me anything they needed to know. Um, you know, I guess they could they could even say, you know, hey, we've got this guy helping us out and maybe build some more interest. I don't know. Um, maybe that's just my ego talking. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, find find some folks who uh, are willing to help you because not because of your track record, but because your idea is so compelling. And, you know, there's there's something to be said for um, a compelling idea. If you're if, if your idea isn't enough to to attract your peers or to attract advisors who, who may want to help you out uh, or to attract a publisher, maybe maybe that's not the best idea in the world. Um, either it's not the best idea in the world or you're so far out ahead of the rest of the world that no one can understand it. Um, and there's something to be said for that too. I mean, uh, the, I think it was, it was Plato who said, uh, if everyone likes what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. That's probably a very bad paraphrase, but um, you know, one of those two things is true. Either you've got the wrong idea, or um, you're you're really out there somewhere and going to change the world. I mean, no one saw Minecraft come. No, I was curious. Um, as far as like building a team, like, do you have a a template that you go with, or or do you do that organically? Because it's you know. It's difficult, right? You could you could go like with an org chart, thinking, well, we need the game director, the the lead programmer, the you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, or you could compose with what you have and like, go organically. What would you, like what what would you think like such a person that wants to start a, a company, a video game company team would would make would do, should do? Yeah, I, I think there's a difference between someone or some group that's starting out. And the way that that I would approach it, um, if you're just starting out, I think you would want to you want to grab anybody you can. Um, you know, if you if you find good people, they'll they'll find a way to make themselves useful. Um, and just having someone in the room with you, where you can swivel or well, a virtual room maybe, uh, where you can swivel around in your chair and and throw ideas around, that may be all you need to start. Um, so if I were just starting out, organic might be the way to go. Um, for me, um, I, I know pretty well what my strengths and weaknesses are. And um, the first thing I have to do every time is find my leads. Uh, you know, I need, I need folks who I can sit in a room with and brainstorm with and uh, who have the skills to actually build that prototype I was talking about. So I need folks who have um, some people skills because eventually they're going to move into uh, heading up a, a team, a discipline team, but also have the hands-on skills to be able to build something because um, because I can't do it myself. Um, so that that's pretty much where I would start. But I think I, I I have an advantage over other people in that you know I I know a lot of people and. Uh, there are other people who want to make the kinds of games that, well, that you and I make. And, and so uh, I would start it differently than, than someone just starting out. So uh, what about working in the border-free post-pandemic world? Uh, 
because the communication and networking uh, like a, a year ago it, everything was different uh, and uh, do we have to be international or do we have to be closed do we still really need office spaces some experts say that programmers specifically need to work close to each other uh, some say that this doesn't affect anything if you have good managing skills and tools. What's your opinion on this? Well, I, I, I have I'm of two minds on this, okay? Um, because uh, other side, I mean, there's a, a team of 22 people, I think, and they're all working remotely. Um, and somewhat to my astonishment, they're probably working at you know, 75% efficiency. Um, surprised the hell out of me how, how well they're doing. Um, so I think it can work. Uh, and moving forward, I, I know that I'm gonna be more open to uh, remote workers than I was before. Um, and there, there are two reasons for that. One is, um, at, uh, you know, earlier on uh, at Other Side, I had a, um, a remote tech director, not just a remote engineer, a remote tech director. And, um, you know, I was here in Austin and he was in uh, uh, Illinois. And I, I didn't know if it was going to work. I mean, the guy was great. I totally wanted him on the team. Uh, but what we tried to do, I stole something from RK, from my old studio, uh, where uh, we just set up a 24-7 Look up, you know, I got a, a really cheap laptop and put it on his desk. I, 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 the way I structured the studio was all of my leads were in a pit and all of the, the actual people who do real work were, were in offices around the outside. Uh, so we could hear everything that was going on. They would have to come in and if they wanted to talk to the art director, I would hear what they were saying and I could swivel around in my chair and say, yeah, that's cool. Here's an idea and thought about this. Anyway. So I set up this laptop uh, on on the tech director's desk and he could hear everything that was going on and we could swivel in our chairs and just talk to him. And if someone needed to uh, talk to him privately, they would we, we would say, go, go pick up Mark's head and carry it into another office, you know, and that was my first clue that maybe remote work would, would actually work. Um, and then uh, seeing the Boston team uh, working as effectively as they have been uh, was pretty powerful. But having said that, the other side of my brain still says you need to be able to swivel around in your chair and have a real conversation and really overhear things, which which doesn't work on a big team. You know, with one person, maybe. But with one person, yes, I know that. But team-on-team -team dynamics just don't happen. And I have a big belief that, not that this is any great insight, but this is the most collaborative medium on the planet. You know, development of games makes movies look like solo activities. And what I always try to do is, uh, like for example, put, um, you know, riggers and modelers together. <laughs> that just makes sense, you know? Um, environment artists and level builders literally sit next to each other. I mean, they have to. Um, so, you know, just throwing stuff over the over a wall doesn't really get you the best results. So, I, I you know, I, I, like I said, I'm of two minds. I mean, right now I'm working with uh, a designer, a senior designer who's in Los Angeles. And I'm in Austin, Texas, and it's working out great. Um, you know, I, so I, I think the, the folks who are going to get it right are the ones who say, uh, all right, we're going to do, you know, three days a week in the office and two at home, two in the office and three, three at home, something like that. Uh, that, that seems like the future. Um, and, and for me, uh, uh, when I build my next team, I'm going to be looking for the, not just the best talent, but the most appropriate talent, um, wherever they are. Uh, I, I'm no longer going to be stuck in, in Austin because, frankly, the competition for resources is ridiculous in this town and getting worse. Uh, and also, um, despite the, the influx of, of uh, tech folks over the last few years, 
this is still a very incestuous community. People go from one studio to another. And so you don't get fresh blood uh, or it's very hard. So I, I'm going to be looking far and wide for people. And if that means working remotely, uh, I'm going to do it. Um, and if you're just starting out, I mean, you've been asking a lot of questions about starting out. Um, I think you just need to get the people, you know, um, and find the people who can work that way uh, rather than saying, well, if you're not in my hometown, then I don't need you. Um, I don't think you can afford to be that picky. I'm not sure I can afford to be that picky. What do you think are the hardest roles to recruit? Oh, all of them. <laughs> all of them um you know okay clearly the hardest is um i'm a big believer in game directors you know you, you can't imagine a movie being made without someone at the helm you can't imagine a play without a playwright you can't imagine you know uh, a ballet without a choreographer um and those folks are ridiculously hard to find I mean, you know um like i said there's a particular, I mean, this whole immersive simulation, shared authorship, uh, players expressing themselves through play. I mean, that's that's what I do. And when I look around at the world, I can think of probably five, maybe six people I would trust with with making that kind of game. Um, so that's, that's got to be the hardest. Um, after that, um, It's hard to say. I mean, graphics engineers are really hard to find. Uh, tech artists, really hard to find. Uh, tech artists can get anywhere and make a ton of money. Like I said, if you're if you're you're in games to make money, you're you're in the wrong place. So, in terms of um, you know individual contributors, I think probably graphics engineers and tech artists would be the toughest. Um, but But then, you know, the, the the tough part, finding people at all is tough. I don't want to downplay that, but finding people who fit on your team, mm. that's that's critical. I mean, I used to, when I was at Origin and EA and uh, Ion Storm and Idos, I mean, I've worked too many places. But anyway, um, you know, I used to say, I can work with anybody. I don't care if you're an asshole. If you're really good at your job, you've got a place at my studio. And I should have learned how stupid that was much earlier in my career. Uh, I used to hire talent over team fit. And now once you hit a specific threshold of talent, it's team fit over talent all the way. Um, so it's, it's you know, I, I mean, I, I, what I say is when I interview folks, The, the people who specialize in something. I mean, artists will help you figure out if an artist is talented enough to be on the team. And engineers will tell you if someone is talented enough as an engineer to be on the team. My main role um, as as the guy who typically runs a studio or acts as, you know, a creative director now rather than, you know, a day-to-day -day game director um, My job is to, to give people the serial killer test. Um, you know, figure out if, if someone is not going to fit or if they're going to be a problem, it doesn't matter how talented they are. Honestly, letting my mouth get ahead of my brain again, I don't care if every artist on my team wants them on the team. If they're not a good team fit, they're not working on the project. Can we talk about some kind of... Uh region related human resources uh, like countries with skillful experts in unique fields of knowledge like there's a uh, there are best cheap programmers over here and most artistically weird 3d artists over there because you know we got companies like Saber Interactive who are famous uh, for their uh, Halo uh, Master Chief Collection remaster. Uh, this company consists of uh, St. Petersburg-based uh, tech specialists. And the, the main office uh, is in New York, uh, if I remember it correctly. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the other things uh, that, that's going on on the other side uh, that, that Paul and I committed to doing early was building a small internal team and then working with external partners. Um, 
you know, people who would essentially become part of the team uh, because we knew there were specials like that out there. Uh, not not only people who are available, but people who are better at stuff than we are, better than 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 the people we could uh, we could find and hire. Um, so uh, I'm a big believer in that, uh, and and look to be doing a lot more of that. I mean, it don't don't hold me to this, but I could even see building a team of leads and then working exclusively with external folks. Um, you know, who, who knows, but certainly a team of 20 people, um, at, at, at least in my experience or with my skill set, is not going to make, um, you know, a, a game that accomplishes or that does what I want it to do. So I'm going to need to be looking externally. And uh, on Epic Mickey, not Epic Mickey 2, uh, Epic Mickey 1, we had a hundred people internally, I think, and about 150 externally. Uh, on Epic Mickey 2, like I said, we had uh, almost 800 people, and um, we did partner. It wasn't just throw stuff over the fence. It was, hey, you folks are a part of the team. Work with 17 external partners. And we went to one, for example, and said, hey, we've got all these 2D bridging sequences. We want, we want this sort of 2D platforming thing, and we want you to just do those, <laughs> you know? We'll work with you on the basic design. You do them, and we'll we'll critique them, and we'll work back and forth just the way you would with anybody internally. Um, and, but it's yours. Go go go. Um, and that's what I'd I'd like to do. Uh, like to do here. Um, you know, it's the the most trivial example of that is I never want to think about you know multi-platform stuff. I want to make the game. And if somebody else handle all the multi-platform stuff, I don't, I don't really want to do that. So we'll find people who are expert in that. We'll find people who are expert in, you know, 2D platforming. We'll, we'll find folks who are expert at uh, maybe even AI, who knows? Um, but uh, that I think is uh, a big part of my future. Uh, I can't speak for anybody else, but it's a big part of my future for sure. Now loading the house of the dead. Let's talk about legal aspects. This is uh, this is something that often is uh, overlooked, but uh, I think it's very important from the very start. Uh, things like registering a website, an IP, social network accounts, and stuff like this. Uh, what can you say about this? What's more important than the rest? Um, is there any kind of to-do list in this context? Um, well, you know, again, it's hard for me to talk about um, people who are just starting out. Um, for, for them, I, I would think the most important things would be um, building a, you know, a public presence, um, you know, engaging with your audience. It may, maybe no one cares at first, but if you don't start somewhere and, you know, post stuff every day, <laughs> just do something every day, uh, something interesting, uh, even if it's like, a book review. I mean, just get your get your name out there. Um, I, I would think that would be really important. Um, you know, once once you become more experienced, like for me, there were um, there were legal ramifications to like creating the wrong kind of corporation. You know, I mean, you want to make sure you're not screwing yourself on the tax side and all that. But again, that's a that's a different set of, of circumstances, different set of problems. Um, you know, uh, contracts and um, uh, NDAs and all that stuff. I mean, frankly, even when you're starting out, I might, I might think about that because the worst thing that could happen would be you have four buddies getting together and coming up with an idea together and one of them leaves and, you know, claims some ownership of the idea that after you've made your, you know, your millions of dollars because you succeeded. So maybe even at the outset, you know, having having a good contract might be a good idea. Outlining uh, who owns what and under what circumstances people can leave, and, um, you know, that that sort of thing might actually be important even when you're starting out. What about trademarks and IPs and stuff like that? Would you yeah. uh, would you spend the money on that? 
Oh, with, because I assume again we're, we're talking about people that are starting, so they, they probably have to um, really be careful about how they spend money. But what would be the strict minimum, you know? I what what I would probably do is um, there you can go online and search the um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office if you're if you're in the United States. Um, I have no idea outside of this country, but the first thing I do is go and do a, a free trademark search. You just go online, enter something, and uh, and see what's what's still alive out there that is either identical to what you want to do or is similar. Um, the other thing you have to think about is, in terms of trademark, um, there are different categories. And so if someone has a trademark that's similar to yours in the, the clothing category, maybe you don't have to worry about it too much, but if they have a, a trademark in games, uh, even it's board games or toys, um, you might want to think about that, but that's free. Um, so certainly when you're starting out and for the, if you're working on a game for two or three years, that's probably enough. Um, at some point, if you're going to go commercial, um, you, you have to engage a lawyer. I mean, you just have to, uh, and get someone who can actually do a trademark search. Um, copyright, um, I've never really worried too much about that, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess you could. I mean, there there are workarounds that that are more or less legal. Like, you know, if you write a, a novel, put a copy of the novel in an envelope and mail it to yourself, so it goes through a government entity and comes back to you with a date, so you can prove that you were doing something before someone else who claims you ripped them. You know, that's that's a cheat, but that's better than nothing. Um, so I, I, you know, maybe you do that with your source code or with an example of source code or, or something, or your design document, if you believe in documentation, which as a note, I do. Um, so, you know, maybe something like that. Um, but again, I would, I would be concerned about, um, people having a falling out and not having a mechanism for or separating for getting divorced that that scares me I, I, i've worked at one company um which will remain nameless uh where there were uh four partners and they were all friends and they all wanted to do the same thing and two of them ended up not liking the other two very much um and there was no mechanism for saying hey you two guys we don't like you anymore. Go away. There was there was just no one gave that any thought, and it was it was terrible. Um, things got really painful. Uh, you know, some some folks had to buy some other folks out. I mean, it was it was really bad. Um, so I would definitely think about that because making games is you know if it either kills you or keeps you young. I mean, it, it's going to do one of those two things. And um, it's super stressful. How do you bring that up? Like, you know, four, four friends that are starting in the, in this, in the, not even this industry, like they might be just like, it might be a, a project that they hope would become something in the industry. And, and then you just go like to lunch and you go, hold on again, like we, we gotta talk about this thing. What happens if it goes wrong? You know, so you make a contract there or something. I, I am a big believer in, um, I'm not Captain Happy, let's put it that way. Um, you know, I mean, we both know Doug Church and, um, you know, I, I've worked with him a lot and we, we used to say, um, we're not wired for happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I always look for the potential problems before, before they come up. Um, if you don't, if it's like, I mean, just the other day I was doing a pitch for somebody and they said, wow, that's really cool. They said, I don't care if it's cool. Tell me what sucks so mm -hmm. I can make it better. You know, and so I would absolutely bring it up. They won't, you know, there's no telling this is going to work. This we're about to embark on one of the most stressful things you can do. Even if you work at one of those places that claims they never crunch, this is super stressful. And people who are friends can end up not being friends. So just, just suck it up, you know, be a, be an adult and look for the problems, look for everything that could go wrong. Um, it's, 
if, if you've got the right people and the right idea, that's they're, they're not going to be scared off. By it. I mean, it's one of those things where um, I said it before, if I can scare you off, you weren't going to succeed. Anymore. So uh, what else can actually go wrong when you are uh, gathering people together? I mean, aside of uh, legal stuff, uh, let's talk about this. That uh, th that topic seems useful. Uh, th there are so many things that can go wrong. Um, you can have personality uh, conflicts. You can have work. Uh, I don't want to say ethic. Work um, style differences. Um, you know, I mean, I've worked at plenty of places where um, overtime, let's just say, was not required. But there were some really strong-willed people, charismatic people who slept under their desks and made everybody else feel bad if they weren't mm -hmm. sleeping under their desks. You know, that's that's a, a toxic situation, right? So work styles can go wrong. Personality conflicts can come up. Um, differences of opinion about money. I mean, holy cow. Um, differences of opinion about who to partner with. I mean, once you start looking for a, a publishing or funding partner, uh, one person saying, wow, really liked working with, the, or like what those folks said, we should work with them. Someone else says, no way, I'm not working with them. I've talked to people who worked with them and they were terrible. You know, you can have conflicts like that. Um, you can have conflicts about the direction of a project. That's, that's what I was saying before. Um, a lot of people disagree with me, but I don't think democracy works. I really don't. I believe that you want to empower your team as much as possible. But someone has to be say, has to say, take that hill. I don't care how you take it, but that's the hill we're taking, you know? And if there's no one like that, projects can go off the rails trivial. You can have that kind of problem. Um, you can have, um, uh, let's just call it diversity problems. You can have folks who don't understand how to interact with people of, uh, of different genders, you know, uh, and get themselves in trouble that way. Um, you know, you can have people who are schedule driven and people who are quality driven. There's that kind of conflict. Um, there are people who are total agile freaks, agile development freaks, and people who believe in waterfall, people who believe in long-term planning, and people who believe that all you should worry about is the next milestone. Um, there, you know, there are as many ways to make a game as there are people making games. And if you, you team up with the wrong people, you know, with people who, who don't, not just buy into your vision of a game, but don't buy into the, the way you want to make games. You can get yourself in all sorts of trouble. So, I mean, you need to interview even your friends at some level. I've never put it that way before, but you really need to make sure that you're you're, you're all going to pull in the same direction. You know? Sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Game development will keep you young or kill you. I think I just said that. That sounds romantic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's funny. Not that I want to get too far into this, um, but you know, people are are really anti-crunch now, and totally justified. It is totally justified. Um, there is no excuse for long-term back-breaking seven-day weeks, twelve-hour days. I mean, there's just no excuse for that. But I will say that you know, when when I started out. Um, there, there is something romantic about working stupidly hard and and being there at two in the morning with people who are not who haven't been told to do it, but who are there because they will not compromise uh, the quality of what they're doing or the vision that they're trying to realize. There is something romantic about that, and I I do actually at, at times think back and, and think, man, that was those are some great times. You know, it's like people. When it gets too extreme, um, it's it's a disaster. Uh, I worked on one game where my boss told me I needed to put my team on seven day weeks, 12 hour days. And I refused to do it. I said, I'm not going to do that. And unfortunately he came over to my team and made them do it. He, he told them to do it, which sucked. But, um, you know, there, there are times when it's just so gratifying to see a team that won't won't compromise, you know. I yeah. mean, 
they're, they're like on on uh, System Shock. The, there were, I mean, the, okay, that team was, it, it was one of the best teams I've ever worked with. And it was partly because of their commitment to the project, right? And they were doing stuff like the day before we went beta, two new features went in and I, I just biffed them out. And, but then I went back to my office and did a little happy dance, you know, because that was a, a team that, that just wanted that, that game to be great. And same project, uh, Harvey Smith was the, the uh, lead tester on that project. And I, I will never forget, you know, two in the morning, being in the, the QA lab, just talking to him for hours about design philosophy, about what was working in the game, and getting to know that he was one of those people who I could trust <laughs> to, to make a game and know that it was going to be the kind of game that, that I want it to be, you know? Um, so there is something to, to, to that kind of uh, situation. How do you deal with it in this modern world, which is very, very um, uh, hostile to crunch or the idea of crunching? Well, I think there are, there are two things. One is, um, well, you, you never mandate it ever, you know, um, you, 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 you call it overtime and mean it. I mean, crunch is, is unhealthy and, and, uh, long-term, but, uh, targeted overtime. Like we have a milestone due on Friday or we have a milestone that is going to make or break this project. Our publishing partner has made demands and if we don't meet them, we are going to get canceled. You know, targeted stuff uh, is okay in my mind. Um, seven day weeks are never acceptable, um, never. Um, you know, six days a week is, is rough enough. But I think the, the key is never mandating it and um, targeting it. Um, where, where I think people go wrong um, is in, in making a blanket statement that says we will never, we will never do, it. um, not because I support it. Again, I, I really want to make it clear. I am not pro crunch. Okay. But you know, if, if, if you're a carpenter and you say, I will never use a hammer, you're going to be really unhappy when you encounter a nail, you know? So just saying categorically that you are going to take a tool out of the toolbox does not make sense to me because if then you encounter that nail, you know, you run up against a situation where in a month we're going to get canceled if we don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, if you, if you then say, well, I know we said we'd never do it, but we got to do it. You're, you're taking something away from the team, you know, you're, 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 it's so much more damaging than if you had just say, not said anything and made it a part of your culture that you didn't do it, not make it a statement that you wouldn't, you know? I mean, like people talk about culture all the time. I've got a whole lecture about company culture and the, the core of it, I mean, I could go on for an hour about this, but the three second version of it is culture is not what you say. And it's not something you create. It's what everybody does every day without thinking about it. It's who you are, right? And you can be a company where, where crunch is not part of your culture. That's the way to do it, you know? So again, there, all that romantic stuff is, you know, that's just me. That's just me talking. Um, uh, for some reason, Maybe I have the worst memory in the world, but I don't remember the pain. I just remember the result and the pride that came from what resulted from it, you know? Uh, and that I think is key. Whatever you're working on, you, you want to be proud of it at the end of the day. That's, you know, you need to define success. I mean, even when you're starting out, okay, let me try to put this in the context of something that you actually care about. Um, you know, if, if you're just doing something to do it, or you're just doing something to pad out a resume, or you're just doing something to make money, you know, I think you're going at it wrong. You want to do stuff that you need to do, or stuff that you know you can take pride in when you're done. And 
again, getting back to me, um, I, I'm probably one of the oldest people still actively engaged in game development. And I, I don't know, you know, I'm not as energetic as I used to be. I mean, I can't work the kind of hours. People don't believe it, but your body actually does change. And I am not physically capable of working the way I used to, okay? Which I always tell my teams, this is totally unfair. I know, but there it is. Um, but at some point, you, you're going to look back. I promise you, this is this is a fact, not just an opinion. You're going to look back on your career, and you're going to say, "What did I leave behind? You know, am I proud of what I did? Did I make a difference?" And, and the, the word legacy, it, it, unless you're, ju it's just a job to you. You're going to think about that, and so. You have to do everything you can to make sure you're working on things that are meaningful to you. Not that made a gazillion dollars. That's nice. Oh my God, do I want to sell a game, you know, that makes, you know, billions of dollars. Don't get me wrong. But there are other success criteria. And and for me, um, you know, making a difference. I'm not saying I ever did this, by the way, just to be clear. But making a difference, being proud of the work I did. Um, advancing my mission in some way. Th those are success criteria that I can get behind, you know? I super agree with what you just said. Um, and it's it's a hard position to hold, actually, uh, because what you... what drives your, your personal criteria of su for success, you know, and which is usually uh, uh, informed by your passion and what you want to... how you want to bring something to the world, uh, might go at odds with uh, business or might go at odds with uh, people who actually bring the money. So how do you convince them that, you know, because as you said, money is nice. It would be, it would be nice if we can make money. Um, but for the person that you talk to, it's not a, it would be nice. It's like, it's got to make money, you know, I don't. Uh, and in fact, for them, it's like, it'd be nice if it's a good game. But frankly, if it made money, it would be better. Uh, so, <laughs> so how do you how do you deal with that uh, conundrum? Everybody's going to have a different answer, okay. And when you're starting out, clearly, what you need to do is get a job. <laughs> you know, um, you probably don't have the luxury of uh, of, of being uh, so stubborn, I guess. But um, what the, the way I always approach there, there are two things. One is having clear success criteria, and I, I have always had that since the, literally since the day I played Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. I have, I have had the same mission in life, okay? And I knew what I wanted to do. And I, 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 what I tried to do was find places that shared that vision, okay? That wanted to do the same thing. Knowing your success criteria can help you find the right places to work. Now, if, like I said, if you're starting out, maybe you just have to go work at a mobile game company, even if you don't want to make mobile games, or go work at a company that makes sports games. Maybe you have to do that. But, you know, knowing you want to make epic fantasy role-playing first-person games, and you're willing to sacrifice to do that, that, you know, that tells you something. And there are, you know, 10 companies in the world doing that go right to them you know and when i was at origin there was uh, a guy who was kind of a hybrid designer writer who got in touch with me had no experience and i frankly i blew him off you know he, he had nothing uh concrete or demonstrable to offer and he called me back the day after i told him no and then he emailed me and then eventually he, he sat in the waiting room until I would talk to him. And that kind of commitment told me more than his resume did. You know, he wanted to work at that company making that kind of game. And he convinced me of that through his, his passion and his dedication. So knowing what what you want to do and be and finding the places that do that is really important the other thing and this 
This is probably the worst advice I will ever give anybody, so don't do what I'm about to say. <laughs> the, the, the way to, to do what we're talking about is to be willing to walk away from it. Um, you know, I, I, I say to this day, and I have said since I started making games, uh, uh, digital games, I, I didn't have to say this when I was in tabletop roleplay because everybody wanted to do the same thing. But in, in the digital space, once I figured out that, that this crazy thing that we've come to call immersive simulation is what I want to do with my life, I have said, and I mean it, if I can't make that kind of game, I will stop making games and I'll go open a bookstore, you know, or something. Um, but like I said, don't, don't, don't adopt. Well, it seems like a reasonable, it seems like a reasonable uh, advice. Why, why, why do you say not, not to do it? Oh, because it's fundamentally stupid. <laughs> I don't actually think so. I agree with uh, with Raf because you know uh, we we had an interview on um, some conference uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, there were those guys who made uh, some kind of um, match three hyper casual mobile stuff, and uh, we were going like, uh, okay, we realized that this game you are making for the money so what are you actually dreaming about uh, what's your favorite genre what games do you actually want to make uh, after you uh, make earn some money with this kind of games and those guys were, were like uh, well actually these are uh, our dream games okay we will all all right so uh, not having, I mean, not having uh, tons of hyper casual games in your resume may seem like a good point in your resume. Yeah, zero. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that, you, you made a good point. Actually, um, I should. I, I was. I believe what I said, and it has served me well over the years. Um, but there is a lot to be said for. When you're breaking in, you know, we were talking earlier about people just getting started. Actually making anything may be the right thing to do, you know, to prove you can finish something and maybe to make some money. Uh, you know, I that doesn't have probably to be a should video have thought game. this through a little more before I started spouting off about, about stopping making games. Um, just, you know, one other related point, um, I've had some success hiring people right out of, out of school. They're, they're, what does what does the ESA say? There are 400 colleges and universities in the, around the world teaching game development at some level, and so there are a lot of people applying for jobs right out of school. And like I said, I've had some success. Um, the the ones I've taken a chance on are the ones who've actually finished something. You know, um, the, in in schools, the, there's a tendency. Um, to start something and get it to a particular level of completion, which is usually not very complete. Um, and that doesn't show me anything. But hey, look, I finished this thing is super powerful. So if you're starting out, finish something. The, the other thing, it's semi-related um, at, at Origin. And I think this is still true today. That th obviously there's a story that goes way back, but um, an engineer, a programmer, came in uh, to apply for a job. And the first thing he did was, after he submitted his resume, was he handed over a floppy disk, which completely dates me in this story. But he handed over a floppy disk. And on it was his um, recreation of Ultima 4. I mean, he started from scratch. He didn't, he didn't revert, I mean, he reverse engineered it from what was on the screen and what he played, not grabbing source code or anything like that. He made Ultima 4 from scratch. He got a job, you know, he wanted to work at Origin, he wanted to make the kinds of games that we made, he proved that he could finish something, and he, he proved that he, he was committed to our mission. I mean, what better way to get a job? Where, where do you think is the limit between the very passionate, enthusiastic, insisting, hopeful person and 
too much, you know, because that it's probably has happened to you. <laughs> I, you know, I've been borderline too much myself, you know, as a, as a young developer. I was like, yeah, I, I want this job. You know, I've been, I've been that pushy guy. Yeah, well, um, I, let me think about that for a second. Um, I certainly have had, I, I, I call them stalkers, <laughs> you know, I've had people who, I mean, I have had a couple of legitimate stalkers who are really scared, but um, there was one guy who, I mean, I don't know his real name, and he he tracked me down at every company. Like I said, I worked a lot of companies, and he tracked me down at every company I worked at, and um, thought we had a personal relationship, which we did not have, and you know, wanted a job. That went too far. <laughs> After you've been turned down at one company multiple times, don't don't follow me around. You know that's that's probably too much. But the rest of it, it's kind of you kind of just gotta feel it out. You know, and, and uh, there's there's a, an expression that I I didn't make it up, but I, I really like called um, that it says read the room. You know, you can't just go into a situation and play it the way you want. To. You have to read the room and figure out what the people in the room need. And then assuming it's not unethical or antithetical to your mission or whatever, you know, give it to them or give it to them in the form that they'll understand. So if you're applying for a job uh, and persistence is is your, your modus operandi, read the room, figure out when you've gone too far. Uh, is I would put it back on the people who are who are being persistent, not on me to know when to shut it off. You're smiling. What are you thinking? <laughs> are you going back <laughs> down memory lane? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I've been uh, I've been a young developer myself, and um, and I, there are moments where, I, you know, I. I I don't know if I was, maybe I was that guy to some degree, you know, like trying to catch my stars at, at uh, E3 uh, and like, you know, going through those awkward moments of, hey, you know, I really, I really kind of like, I'm a big fan of what you do and I just don't know what else to say, but you know, it's, it's kind of weird, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and, and, you know, in some ways it's paid off for me, but, um, but yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, a young developer right now. There's probably tons of them that are in those shoes, and they don't know. They don't know when they when they're pushing too much. You know, it's uh, it's it's diff it's hard because it's true. I mean, like a lot of story. You hear a lot of stories like that. I have some as well myself. You know, my my frankly, my the best producer I've ever worked with, uh, Julien, who's followed me since the very very beginning like, of Arcane in '99. In he was 16 or 17 when he first time he emailed me and you know and uh he was like it was annoying you know it was uh it was, uh, <laughs> it, it was and uh somewhere between cute and annoying he was really, really pushy uh emailing me like hey i'll do anything coffee anything please please you know i like exactly the same game as you like what that you mentioned in interviews and, and eventually I, I gave him a chance and you know some of it is because he was so insistent, but but at the same time, it could be, a, you know, it could be too much. Uh, it's it's hard. It's hard to know where the, where the limit is. Yeah. Well, uh, I had another another experience where um, a person got in touch with me and wanted a job as an, an audio engineer, and um, I said no. There wasn't enough experience. I had a full staff. You know, whatever. And um, this person, again, very, very persistent and tracked me down at, at GDC one year. And, um, well, actually, I, I stepped back. Uh, they started contacting people at my studio, like phoning people at my studio directly uh, to try and, I don't know, do something, make an impression, something. But they, they tracked me down at GDC and, and said, I know how to, how to make your sound great. I can, I can fix all your sound problems. And I just 
uh, you know, I said, no. They said, well, I've got a present for you. Can I give you this present? You know, like that's going to make a difference. And I just said, leave it, leave it at the IGDA booth and I'll pick it up there. And so the next day I was, I was running by the, G, the IGDA booth and one of the people behind the desk said, you have to come over here and take this away, you know, because they had, they had left um, a bag, a grocery bag, <laughs> folded over at the top, stapled about a thousand times uh, and, and had come back like every half hour to see if I had picked it up. And it, I, so I took it and I brought it back to my hotel room and I actually opened it, which is probably stupid. And inside were two bottles of my favorite alcoholic beverage. How she knew, I don't know. But it, I mean, maybe I said something in an interview or something. But you should tell us what it is now. More people will know, and more people will send it to. You. Anybody wants to give me some of it? I'm okay. It's a plum brandy. It's terrific. Um, drink it straight. It's. It, oh, I can't. I hope nobody underage is listening. Way to go. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> Probably they are. <laughs> anyway, what I did was, you know, I, I left it in the hotel room because I figured, you know, they, they could have put pinholes in there and poisoned it or something. So uh, I, I left it. But anyway, you know, you know, that's, that's too um... persistent. Yeah, that is, that is. But you know, that conversation is, uh, um, is interesting to me. It's specific in the concept, of, in the context of you and I talking because uh of course uh, you know i'm 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 uh, uh i'm younger than you as a developer and uh i was i was a huge fan of origin you know i was a huge fan of origin and um and uh, we we did talk a couple of times and uh and uh it, yeah it does bring up some memories you know because i, I was uh, i was a bit of that that guy and but the immigration was so complicated and uh you know just for the story i don't know if you remember but uh richard uh, Garriott eventually uh, sent me a contract uh, when I was when I was uh, still at EA. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, he sent me a contract for uh, for an assistant and um, was like for a designer. Uh, yeah, game designer, like game designer level, whatever you know. You had that that levels in there for Ultima Online Two back then, and uh, yeah, right. And um, and then uh, I signed on my side. And it never got signed on the other side, uh, and and I was I was like, what what's happening? You know, what's happening? And uh, I was trying to contact Richard, and you know, we were still in that phase where you know I was trying not to be too much of a pain, and and uh, and then I, we heard the, re the 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 news that EA was actually closing Origin, uh, and so that so I knew I knew I would not get the job. <laughs> yeah, that's a good clue. I, I was that close to 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 come to Origin at some point. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, my my origin, uh, the, my origin origin uh, is is uh, a little similar, I guess. Um, you know, I was I was working at, at TSR, uh, working on you know Advanced Dungeons and Dragons stuff and Top Secret, and a bunch of other stuff, and um, I I was playing computer games obsessively a lot more frankly than i was playing tabletop role-playing games by that point and it was it was around the time that uh the gold box games it, it, which are really old now but they were the first licensed D, D games and you know we we tested them at tsr and they were great games for what they were trying to do i mean they recreated the um the, the mechanics and 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 the the systems of, of Dungeons and Dragons, but I played them and and I remember thinking these are these are simulating the wrong things. They're not capturing what makes D and D interesting. It's not the you know strength, dexterity, charisma. It's not those characteristics or the, the stats and the die rolls. It's it's that feeling that I mean. Jackie and I have been doing this for a long time. It's that feeling of, of telling stories together and expressing yourself and experimenting and figuring out how to get past challenges, not solve puzzles. That's what that's what's interesting about tabletop role playing games. And I I knew that that could be done in, in computer games too. And I knew that partly because I played I played Ultima Four, 
and just fell in love with it, you know? And then uh, I was lucky enough that I got, and this is, there's a lesson here for newbies and folks who, who you know, want to find a place that, that where they can fit in, right? So this is not just a story that, that I'm telling for fun. Um, but I, I was lucky enough to, uh, to get on a panel about role playing at a science fiction convention. And Richard Garrett was on the panel. At the, t- at the time, he was working on Ultima 5. And he started talking. I'm getting chills just thinking. About it. He started talking about what he hoped to achieve in Ultima 5 and what he thought computer games could be. And I was sitting there thinking, this guy is saying everything I've been saying at TSR and more. <laughs> And nobody up there is listening to me. <laughs> so I, I got to find a way to work with this guy. And, um, you know, I here's where I got lucky. I didn't have to be very persistent on me because he, I guess he liked me too, because I was saying stuff on the panel that fit in with, with his worldview because we agreed. But I, I went back to Lake Geneva, the TSR, and I, I will never forget this. I was sitting in my office with... Uh, 20-sided dice in one hand and percentile dice in the other. And I just said if, if, to myself, if, if this is the biggest decision I have to make in my career, I need to find another career, you know? And at about that same time, I got a call from a guy I'd worked with at another game company saying Origin was looking for uh, an associate producer, you know? And it, was I interested? And I, of, yeah, you bet. And I, I went down and I interviewed. Uh, it was two days of interviews. One of the interviews, no lie, was nine hours long. <laughs> okay. Um, but I guess I passed the test and they made me an offer. I took a huge pay cut. TSR actually paid pretty well, relatively speaking. But I took a pay cut because I had to do it. I had to make that kind of game. And that was the place that was making that kind of game, you know? So it, it goes all the way back to what I was saying before. Knowing what you want, who you want to be, uh, is is critical. And if you can only do that by, by doing something yourself, because there's no one else doing it, you're, you're either going to go out of business or you're going to change the world. And either way, you, you gave it the best shot you could, you know? Yeah. And it's it's a drive that people have or don't have, right? It, it's 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 hard to uh, it's hard to generate it. Yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't make it happen. It, it it's the same thing as culture. It's not something you can teach. It's something you have or you don't. Would you would you say it's full of sacrifice? Would you say what? I mean, I I, I connect a lot with what you say, obviously, and. Um, um, in some ways, it's a little bit of a lonely road, though, right? It's 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 a, it's a hard one to uh, to yeah. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, there are sacrifices. Um, You know, uh, like I said, there you sacrifice sleep. Uh, Sometimes you sacrifice health, not not purposely, but you know that that has happened. At at Origin, we used to have a thing we called the Origin divorce. Uh, You know, I mean that's horrifying. Um, It is. It's it's a funny word. Yeah, I've. We, we had people showing up, banging on the doors naked in the middle of the night, you know. We had, um, uh, at, at another studio I worked at, um, we were working, not that hard, but we were working pretty hard uh, on something. And one guy just lost it. I mean, he tipped his desk over. He started shouting. He stormed out of the office. Um that it like i said it's stressful and it'll it'll kill you but the you know i i'm lucky i'm I'm lucky in so many ways it's unbelievable but one of the ways i'm lucky is i have the most understanding wife on the planet because she didn't give me a hard time when i would come home at three in the morning or two in the morning and and not remember the drive home that was a little scary too um Mm. you know but a lot of people you know, their their wives aren't willing or their husbands aren't willing to make that sacrifice. So, um, yeah, it, it can be rough, no doubt about it. But again, what, what else would I have done? You know, I've been doing this for 38 years. I, 
I'm not qualified to do anything else. I'm barely qualified to do what I do. Yeah, it's constant learning, eh? Uh, absolutely. I was saying that just the other day. You know, if yeah. it is, if, th that's the other thing. The, I, I realize I've, I've taken this, like we're taking a left turn at Albuquerque here, but um, you know, I, I've worked for a lot of uh, a lot of publishers, funding partners, who who think, well, th this guy's made a bunch of games. He knows what he's doing, you know. And then I screw up because I always screw up. And what they don't understand is every game is different. Every team is different. It, it, I mean, everything is different from project to project. Yes, there's stuff that carries over, but um, this is not like making widgets, you know? It's just not. So it is a, a life of learning, no doubt about it. So yeah, to me, that sounded like a perfect finale uh, thanks very much uh, no, it was my pleasure I mean I had know, a great time oh no don't make me talk about games twist my arm <laughs> <laughs> I could do this all day yeah that, that was the point <laughs> mm -hmm.